Welcome to Mighty House. This is a show for people with problems. Home improvement problems, that is. And for people who want common sense guidance on how to build green and live a more sustainable lifestyle. Send an email. The Mighty House crew is on the job. This is Mighty House. And we're back. Today we're going to talk about generators and what size should you select for your house. Do you need a large one? You want to run the whole house? Or are you just going to get a small one because you just need to run the refrigerator, maybe a sub pump? So before we do that, click on that subscribe button, dingle on the bell, and uh, we'll let you know next time we post something. All right. So the big question is, when you go to select this generator, how are we going to run it? Right. I think that's really the first thing. You're going to run it on gas, gasoline, or are you going to run it on uh, electric? Diesel? <laughs> run it on electric <laughs> yeah uh propane or natural gas right and kind of what drives that selection rich well so two major issues which we'll get to is what like you just said what you're going to put on that generator right the load so right. how many kilowatts do you need and what's the demand but then the second part of that is we're mostly propane down here is how long based on the size of that generator, how long is it going to run? Right. So natural gas has a little longer run time than propane. There's propane still a little bit weaker in potential energy than natural gas. But propane, you know, if, if, like in my case, I have a 500 gallon tank, right? So if I did a 14 kilowatt generator, that's enough to run AC, a bunch of stuff in my house. Maybe not the whole house, but a pretty good bunch in it. Correct. At 100% power, the rating on the 14 kilowatts says that it's going to burn 2.3, 2.23 gallons per hour. Right. Okay. At 100%. So if I load it up, right, want to run right. the whole That means with a 100 gallon tank, you can run 44 hours, which is not even two days. Right. So we're so usually without power five to seven days. So right there tells you you either need a larger tank a smaller generator or lessen the load. Right. So that's where we try to get that through to people. So we've done thousand gallon tanks, which then right. I could get 15 days out of it. So now, but do you have room for a thousand gallon tank? So, <laughs> exactly. So that's why the, what you're powering with, with is important. And most people go propane or natural gas. You can get a diesel generator, but nobody wants to deal with fueling it. Right. Well, and then the gasoline ones, like if you're just going to do a small one, because all you're going to do is run a sump pump, your refrigerator, freezer, and, you know, just plug them in and you've got a portable one, then the most common one is going to be a gasoline one. Right. So you just got to hope that the local gas station has power and can pump more gasoline for you. Yes. So, and uh, I mean, the one we've got one, it, you know, it's five gallons. It'll run for probably 12 to 15 hours on that, on that five gallons. And, right. it's, uh, and some are like that. Portable is a different animal, and I actually run a portable, but mine's a dual fuel, so I run it on propane. So I have okay. a quick connect for my tank and everything. But there, too, note that uh, if you buy a generator that has, a, let's just say, a, a 2,000-watt rating, you're only going to get 1,600 watts out of it on propane. Okay. It's 80% of whatever it listed for gasoline you're going to lose 20% on propane. So you right. have to upsize the size. So again, it's just do the math, right? Or learn. Correct. Correct. And um, so when you're, when you're doing that, the, the next thing is if you're going to use something, a larger one, I, I think the next question is, do you want it to automatically start? Yes. Do you want, or do you want to have, some people don't, you know, don't want to be, have it worry about it. So even if they're not home, the thing will start up, it'll run, it'll do its own thing, and you don't even have to be home. Right. Versus, versus one that you pull out of the garage, you, one, you've got to be home, and right. then you've got to pull it out, set it up in the storm, plug it all in, and get it all fired up. So it's a lot of work, and if you've got other stuff going on, you may may not want to do that. So here, here's a transfer switch that I just pulled up. This will automatically sense whether or not there's power coming from the grid, and as soon as it stops coming from the grid, it'll give about a 15 second delay. It will automatically start the generator. Once it senses power coming from the generator, the transfer switch will throw. And now it'll fire up those circuits that you've got running. 
whether it's the whole house or just uh, a few circuits in the house. So it'll automatically do that for you, whether you're home or not. And I think these these things are a true safety item because a lot of people know, you know, you take a uh, generator and you hook it into your outlets or whatever, and you're actually sending juice back onto the, the lines and you can actually kill somebody else. Correct. You know, when they think there's no power and you're actually putting juice back on the grid, that's how yes. you kill linemen, you know, and, and hurt them. So, right. yeah, if you're going to do something where you're going into your service, then you should always have a transfer switch. Right. Now, this will also then sense when the power comes back on and then switch back over to the utility grid. And then it'll go through a cool down period for your generator and then shut your generator off automatically. So, um, you know, at least in our area, all we're installing are the natural gas because natural gas is on every house in our in our work area. So right. we're always- now, Ours is spotty. There's areas that have natural gas. Um, but I know for a fact in, in downtown Naples, when we have a hurricane, they shut the gas feeds off. <laughs> Oops. Well, because the surge is so high that the regulators go underwater. Okay. So it causes a lot of issues. They don't want the salt water, you know, and the regulators. And what happens is your regulators stop working when they fill with water. So when you're supposed to have one or two inch water column or seven inch water column, you can get two PSI. Right. Not and not not inches of sea seawater column. That's right. right. <laughs> it's it's <Right>. different. <laughs> okay. So that's so definitely you want to mount it full time. Natural gas would be the best. Um, and then, but what do you want to run on that generator? So this is how we figure out how to size that generator. Correct. So uh, let me let me I'll share. Uh, here's a household chart that um, that you can find these online anywhere, but it'll give you a good overview of what the running watts are for that particular device that you want to run. And also something to think about is the startup because uh, items with a electric motor, they'll have a heavier draw to get the thing started. And once it's started, then it'll calm down and, and pull less juice. Just to give you an right. idea, a refrigerator right. freezer, has 2200 watts start, but then only 700 watts running. So, I mean, that just gives you a quick example of what that electric motor will do. Some pumps are the same way. They're almost twice as much on startup for mm -hmm. a half or, or a one third. Um, but if you have something small like a televisions or the toasters, they don't have really have a, a startup. So- no, that don't show air conditioners. On uh yeah oh, there it is it's, i'm sorry it's its own it's its own separate tab right so down here if you have a 10,000 btu ac unit 3,000 on startup 1500 watt running and if you have 24,000 btu that's almost 5,000 and 3,800 running so in a 24,000 btu that's two ton correct so and i know in my house i have a three ton so i probably would be somewhere around 7,000 startup watts or or maybe 6,000 startup watts or something. Right. And normally when we're sizing these, at least in our area, we don't worry about the uh, the AC unit, but we will hook up a fan for the, blow, uh, for the furnace because it's a natural gas furnace. So then we'll hook up the blower, which doesn't pull a lot, but now you've got heat in the winter. So uh, that's, that's really a good, good thing to think about. Um, if you've got electric heat, you may not want to hook this up and, and be running electric heat because those electric furnaces really can uh, suck a lot yeah, of juice. It's a lot of draw. So uh, well, that'll help you size the unit you want. Select the items that you want to uh, run. Garage door opener, sump pumps, freezers, uh, refrigerators, sump pumps, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe your security system. But then... You can now add that up and that'll help you size your the, pro the proper generator. And you, then you can turn around and go, well, okay, do I still want to run it on natural gas? Um, can I run it on natural gas? Do I want to get a portable unit? Do I want a, one that's installed? So it kind of all just folds back into those other questions that we've already right. been talking about. Right. And so the next point is like, if you want one that's installed, where are you going to install it? There's some things you need to know about where you're installing it. And this can be very dangerous. So let me pull this little uh, chart up here. So now you can see this right here. So you want to be within five feet 
of any window or door. If it's a fixed wow. window, you can probably get away from it, but um, it needs to be at least five feet away. 18 right, you want to be five, five feet away. Huh? You, you said you wanted to be within five feet of a window. No, you must be five feet away from a window. Right. No, I don't even spoke. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Because otherwise, you're just going to get emails. Yeah. So, um, so if you look, th this is just the one that we use for Generac. Uh, you need, and a lot of people plant bushes right in front of it. Mm -hmm. So you need three feet on all side, on three sides of it, and then within 18 inches of the house. So, so and then you want to check with your municipality also. A lot of people would want to put it on the side, you know, right next to their neighbors, but make sure it fits within the setbacks mm -hmm. of the property lines because it could end up being too close to the property line. And then you'll get it installed. The neighbor complains about the noise from it. The village comes out or the municipality comes out and then they tell you to move it. So check, you, sh it, you, you should be pulling permits when you do this anyway. Uh, Correct. Just because you're messing with the electrical utility. So. Um, if somebody wants to install this for you and they say, oh, no, you don't need permits, you, you double check with your municipality and make sure because right. the most likely they're going to require it. Yes. So there's just a quick idea of how to site your uh, your generator. Mm -hmm. And if you're running one, a portable unit, don't run it in the garage. Don't set it right outside the back door. Pull away from the house because those are actually putting up probably worse fumes than the natural gas or the propane ones. And that gets in the house and then, you know, all of a sudden everybody goes to sleep and doesn't wake up anymore. Right. So, we have that every year. Every hurricane, there's at least, you know, two people die from carbon monoxide poisoning from running a generator in the garage. In the garage. Yep, because they didn't want to pull it out. No. Um, okay, gas line sizing. I don't know if we need to really get into this. No, I think, it, yeah, we'll just talk about it a little bit. I mean, explain what, you know, like 3.5 to 7 inch water column is versus PSI. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I think everybody understands what pressures per square inch, right? That's kind of forceful. But when we start talking about inches of water column, people don't realize it's the equivalent of, think about it not by pressure, but by sucking. Right. So if you took a straw and put it in a glass of water, how much effort does it take to draw the liquid up 3.5 inches in that straw? It takes very little effort, right? Correct. So that's our point. It takes very little pressure to feed a right, you know, through that regulator to feed one of these. So that's why the regulator is so important because if you're trying to run it at three PSI, you're pumping so much fuel in there that it's just going to explode or something catastrophic is going to happen. <laughs> so you have to understand that. That's why you have to have those regulators. So right. again, if you, you know, your generator installer, if he doesn't know, then you need a separate, you know, a plumber or the gas company to come out and redo either your regulator or your pipe sizing. Right. Or you, a lot of times uh, when we do an industrial application, we have to put a separate regulator just to feed the generator because yeah. they're running, you know, they're running way higher than seven inches of water column to feed their furnaces and, and other equipment. So, we end up having to step it down and we mm -hmm. might have to put a several regulators in there because there's ranges just to step it down to get it in there. So um, the other thing is if you're running this gas line and it's after the furnace and the water heater, and then you're trying to run the, the generator, well, yeah. the generator may run, but then it won't feed the, have enough pressure to feed the furnace or the water heater. So right, it may starve one of the other pieces on that main line. Right. And most likely it's the first one in the line that will keep running because it'll suck everything else out and it won't let the other stuff go. So you'll end up having to come right off the service and then pipe one inch pipe all the way over to your generator. That way mm -hmm. you're, the pipe size, I tend to like to go over a little bit because you can always step it down right at the generator. Right. Uh, but you don't want to run half inch all the way over because that's all it technically requires. And it's a 30 foot run. And, it, you know, and it's just not enough. You're not getting enough inches of water column there to really pressurize it right. And then you should have run three quarter or one inch. So we just run one inch. It covers everything. And we're, we know we're good for sure. You want to do your tank size. And I think I hit on that one when we opened the show. Right. It's, you know, once you figure out the size of that generator uh, and, and what you want to run on it, 
then you can determine your tank size. So there you could probably get away with two or three days. <laughs> That's a lot of liquid propane there, brother. Yep. That one will take care of a whole neighborhood. <laughs> so that I just, I, I ran across that picture. I went, oh, okay, we got to use that one. That's got to be like a 10,000 gallon tank. Yeah. I mean, just look how, look at it next to the crane, how huge that yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. That crane looks small, right? Yeah. That's crazy. So, so size your tank based on how many days you want to kind of have it think, run right. or potentially to have it run. And if you've already got propane on your house because you've got it for your heat and maybe you're cooking with propane, then you may not have much of an issue when you worry about your tank size. Right. So uh, let's see. And then, okay, wire breaking, wire breaker size. Right. And that's more you now, man. <laughs> I'm the electrician, wire and breaker sizing. Okay. So let's, let's get into this because – a lot of times we go into a house and someone has a 15 amp breaker. Do I have you want to look up this this form here? This is from the National Electric Code. It is 31016, table 31016. That's that's the, the Bible for what your wire size is based on the amperage. And it also goes by the insulation type. So right. most of what you buy today is THHN. That's going to be a, a, a stock one. So you're going to use this column over here, whether you got copper or aluminum clad copper. So you, you've got both those options. And if you have aluminum wire, you're not going to be able to run as much amperage as if you've got copper. So I think anybody really uses aluminum wire. We use a feeder conductors, but you know, our mains. Correct. That's where we're limited. So everything inside the house is still all copper. Correct. So you'll notice on here, like a 14, number 14, it's rated for 25 amps with THHN, but it's derated to 15. And they derate the 12 from 30 to 20, and they derate number 10 from 40 down to 30. They derate that because they know people are going to overload those circuits, and those are the most common wires you're going to find in a house. Once you get to number eight, there's no more... Uh, derating form you can you can go ahead and run your 55 amps on that number eight wire so with that when you start looking at your circuits and you're disconnecting from your main panel and you're going to start moving that stuff over to your generator you want to look at the wire size forget what the breaker says because if you have a 20 or a 30 amp breaker on a number 14 wire you're going to max out that wire and now you're going to have heating issues and possible fire issues with it. So that's why you right. want to follow the derating. And then if it's a number 14, you're going to put a 15 amp breaker on it and then put it in your panel. If for some reason that 15 amp breaker is tripping, then you need to separate that that circuit out and, and split it up so that it doesn't have as much of a load on it. So um, that'll go ahead and, and lay out your whole panel and all your breakers so that you got all the proper wire sizing. Did I get into that too much? No, I was just actually. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe kinda, I should stop your, now. <laughs> your picture is grainy is the bigger problem. Oh, okay. Well, good. Because I don't want anybody using this. Go online and find it. 31016, look it over. They, okay. should, they shouldn't be looking this stuff up anyway. So, And if you look at the bottom, it'll tell you what those are all derated because they've got the little asterisk on next to them. Gotcha. So, and then you'll notice here that Number 16 and 18, you can't even use until you get to the THH end column. There we go. Okay, so that's the wire sizing, breaker sizing. When you're putting those into your sub panels and you're moving those circuits over, make sure you're using the correct wire size when, when you're putting those jumpers in. Because a lot of guys will just take the existing wire from the main panel, put a wire nut in there, and then just run a jumper over to the, um, to the sub panel that's running on the generator. So you want to make sure you're using the right wire size when you do that. And then control wires. This is a this is a problem we see a lot uh, when we have to go out and service generators we didn't install. The older ones, there's control wires that sense and and start to tell tell the generator to start to turn it off. Right. There's also wires that go out there to charge the battery. 
So when when all that's going on, those a lot of guys will just run those right through the with the high power wires also. So now you've got your 110 volt wires in there with low voltage, and you're not supposed to put those both in the same pipe. So you will catch that happening. And the other thing with electromagnetic magnetic field of the larger wires will cancel out those smaller wires and the, the unit won't start and stop properly. So you have to break those wires out and run them in a separate pipe or keep to even just keep them on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that way your control wires will, will work properly. Uh, service wires generally to sub panel will go back to our 310 16. I see people, they, they derate those and they, they're running small wires to feed that, that generator and everything else. And that those wires melt, the contacts melt, and we have to rebuild those transfer switches because the wire size wasn't done correctly. So you got to really pay attention to that. So, you know, if, if it's generating heat, it's going to turn into fire. So, <laughs> yes. So uh, one other issue we run into a lot is the grounding and bonding. So we can kind of go over this a little bit. You should have a ground coming from your meter socket mm -hmm. through your main electric panel and then to a ground rod. And then that should also go to your water line. Right. Now I have two two ground rods 10 feet apart, all wired together and so on. Correct. Right. The new code today is requiring two ground rods, two eight foot ground rods. And then the other odd thing down here is that we actually tie in that, and this goes on, I'm going to walk over you on this, on the bonding. Okay. So we have what we call a building ground because everything's done with concrete and rebar. We have one piece of rebar that we watch out for from the day we start pouring the footings. And it's painted green and it rises five feet above the footing. And then we have a hole in the block and that ground and and everything ties to that piece of steel, building steel. Uh -huh. And that is part of our ground system throughout the entire thing. Then we run bond wires, which is not grounding. Bonding is a way to tie the electrical potential of dissimilar metals together. So if you've got a piece of black pipe in your case, in your case for the gas line, yep. and I have a piece of galvanized conduit, they don't have the same potential. They will not carry electricity at the same potential, a slight variation. Correct. What happens is if you're somebody with a pacemaker or other medical condition, if you hold both those pipes, that difference in milliamps is enough to stop your heart. And that's why bonding became such a huge issue. Bonding is not grounding. Grounding is not bonding. But bonding is to tie all your types of metals together. And that's why your hot water supply and cold supply, you know, those are usually copper. Your gas line might be, you know, like we say, it'd be black pipe. And then, you know, you might have galvanized for, or, uh, you know, either THHN or the thick wall for your electrical. All right. different potential. Correct. And I liked this example here because it shows you the difference between the bonding jumpers and the grounding lines. So mm -hmm. uh, you wanted the water meter, you should have a bonding jumper that jumps that water meter. And then same from your hot water to your cold water line, and then from your cold water line to your gas line. Those are the most common areas that, that we have to deal with. And like you said, down, uh, down in Florida, you're actually then bonding the house um, the steel up because of all the rebound we have so and it's and it's important to do you don't want uh the kids to be outside playing by the generator and then they bump into it they're chasing a ball or something and then they grab it and get a, get shocked from it so um make sure you get all the grounding and bonding put together yeah and then the last item we've got here is maintenance no nah, you they just do their own thing storm hits you start it up Okay, so last week we had a storm, knocked out the power. Two of our clients that I always send out say, you know, it, it's been two years. You need to have come out, let us come out and check in service. Email back, no, it's fine. It runs okay. Don't worry about it. Two of them called because the batteries had gone dead and weren't working and it didn't start. And of course, they lost power. So you know, scramble, go pick up a battery, go out there, get it started. So if you do that maintenance, once a year, that's all you got to do. Change the oil, change the oil filter, check your air filter, make sure it's all good. Go ahead and go downstairs and turn off the breaker 
to make sure their transfer switch will automatically start and switch over. You want to test that, make sure that all works, and then turn it back on, turn that circuit back on, make sure it turns off automatically, and just exercise it. That's all you got to do. If you've got the automatic start, they'll 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 check themselves uh, every week. At least the Generax do. Uh, they run for 15 minutes. Make sure you get all the fluids in there. Gets all the moisture out of the oil, and it's just it runs long enough to heat up and get all the water out of the oil. So that that part's good. And then to now they also have a Wi-Fi connection and a module we can put in there that if there is a problem, it will send the homeowner a note, an email, or a text. It'll also send the the uh, installer a note telling them what's wrong with it. So uh, that's a nice service to have if you want to spend mm -hmm. that money for it. Um, at least that notification. That way you don't you don't even need to be home. Mm -hmm. It'll send out a notification that it didn't start right or that there's another issue. The contractor right. gets that notification, comes out, does the service. You're out of town. Everything's still good. Your basement still doesn't flood. So right. um, maintenance is extremely important. Anything, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you don't ever change the oil in your car, how long is it going to run? Right. So, uh, there you go. All right. With that, um, I think if you've got any questions, go ahead and post them down there. Uh, we'll jump in there and answer them for you. Uh, on the the grounding, the there's a bunch of different manufacturers out there. The the Kohlers, the Generax. Uh, got any questions? Post them down below, and uh, we'll get get back to you and get those questions answered. In the meantime. Keep, Keep it square and level. Until next time. <laughs> Until next time. There you go. There you go.